Coming to you from the greatest city in the world, this is the number one showbiz podcast. It's Talk for Two. Here's your host, Matt Bailey. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Thank you so much to our announcer, Gary Owen, and to our season sponsors, Axtell Expressions and the Tangent Bound Network. You can find fantastic podcasts at tangentboundnetwork.com, and all your entertainment needs are at axtell.com. Welcome in, everybody, to a holiday episode. I hope you are listening to me while you are grilling and uh, enjoying time with your family. Because this is, I believe, our very first episode to air on Independence Day. As such, I wanted to air an episode with a guest that was uniquely American, important to our culture. And I have to tell you, Burt Ward is an excellent fit. Mr. Ward is known for his role as Robin in the original Batman series. He co-starred along Adam West from 1966 to 1968 for 100 episodes across three seasons. The show became an instant hit for its campy, fun style. And Burt tells me that about 50% of all television sets were tuned to the Batman premiere in January of 66. Both the show and tie-in film have since become a cult and cultural classic in America, with reruns airing constantly to this day. But Burt Ward has turned his attention to something else, rescuing dogs. You could say he's gone from caped crusader to canine crusader. Through his gentle giant's rescue, Ward and his wife Tracy have spent countless hours and dollars caring for our four-legged friends. Their mission is an admirable one expand the life expectancy of large dogs. Gentle Giant's specially formulated dog food, Mr. Ward claims, does just that. He tells us the secret is that his dry food is low fat. I told you, this is a great interview for our most patriotic of holidays. An actor from a classic American television show talking about man's best friend, I think yes. Here now to the Batmobile, our interview with Burt Ward. Bert Ward, welcome to Talk for Two. How are you today, sir? Fine, citizen. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, this, I can tell already this is going to be fun. Now, w- w- jump right into it. You owe your acting career to a producer you sold your house to. This story is so interesting to me. Do you mind telling it? You sold a house? Oh, no, I'd be happy to. It, it, well, I, actually, it wasn't my house. Oh, did I, I say your house? I was oh, one of the... Uh, I was one of the youngest real estate agents in yeah. uh, in uh, Beverly Hills, and my my father was a top real estate broker, and I got my license at age 18, which is the youngest you're allowed to get in the state of California. Mm. And uh, I was sitting on houses on the weekends for my dad, and I sold a house um, with assistance from my dad to a producer named Saul David, who produced the Our Man Flint Pictures, Skullduggery, and uh, a number of other wonderful feature films. And he was very nice. I told him I wanted to be an actor. I told him that I'd been studying professionally as well as studying at UCLA. And I asked him if I could do a scene for him, which I did. And then he said, you know, I was really good. He says, let me send you to an agent. So he sent me to an agent. And the first thing the agent said is, I can't get the actors that I have any work. I don't want to take any new people on. And the only reason I'm doing this is because Saul David you know, suggested it and I'm obligated to do it. So, uh, you know, don't expect to get any work for a year. And if you do get any work, you're probably going to get a single walk on part and have maybe three or four words to say. Yeah. Well, that was a little bit of a harsh opening there. You know, Mm. first, the first thing I tried out for was the part of Robin, which, um, I competed against 1100 other young actors um, when I was sent out for the part, I had no idea what it was. These agents called me and they said, Oh, 20th century Fox has got something going over there. Go see this casting director. I said, Oh, well, what's, what is it about? I don't know what it's about. Just go over there. Right? They're so uninterested. Yeah. So I go over and I go see the casting director and he says, Oh, okay. And he says, would you like to meet the executive producer? I said, Sure. I figured everybody gets to meet the executive producer, which is not true. <laughs> but I went in to see the executive producer. His name was William Dozier. And he looked at me, and the first thing he says, you're awful big for the part. I said, well, sir, I promise you I won't grow anymore. <laughs> and he laughed. 
And he said, uh, you know, and I and I shook his hand. I looked right in his eyes. Very nice to meet you, you know, because I am a, a bit of an intense person by nature. Yeah. So one of the things he asked me was, I well, I guess you've been playing parts between 15 and 17. I said, uh, yes, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. He said, uh, you, and then he said, would you like to do a screen test? I said, sure. Again, figuring everybody did this, got to get the screen test, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. which is not true. So that's what happened. I went back for the screen test. I guess it was a week or 10 days later. And all I got was a single sheet of paper that said Bruce and Dick as the two characters. Mm -hmm. And they had some simple lines, you know, nothing that would really reveal anything but Bruce and Dick. I had no idea what this was for. So I did the lines, you know, and everything seemed to come out all right. And I figured I was finished. And they said, oh, no, no, you're not finished. You need to go over to that trailer. And we have two wardrobe men waiting for there over there to help you get dressed. And I said, <laughs> help me get dressed? I'm perfectly capable of dressing myself. No, no, just go over there. You'll see what we're talking about. So I go over there and I go in the dressing room and I, and, the, and there's these, you know, two gentlemen there. And I looked out on the, on this kind of a, a, it's kind of a bench couch type thing. And I see all this strange stuff. I mean, what looks like a giant yellow cape a red vest with an R on it, a uh, green T-shirt, green trunks, green booties with ears on them, kind of, you know, yeah. these bat boots, uh, and these horrendous-looking leotards, <laughs> you know. And and they said, well, here's what you got to do. You got to, you know, pull up these leotards. We're going to help you with the rest of your costume. I have never been so uncomfortable in my entire life. You know, yeah. I, I've never been a claustrophobic person, but in that costume, I was claustrophobic. Okay, I, I, my my theory is that man was not built for tights. <laughs> in any event, I so agree. I got dressed in this, and and you have to understand, I I had no idea what this was for. All I could figure were the tights must mean it's some Shakespearean or period project or something. I had no idea what this is for. And, and it, as it turns out later on, uh, you see, I, where I grew up, they had Superman comic books, yeah. but they didn't have any Batman. There was no Batman. So I had never heard of Batman. I never heard of rock. Wow. So it's anyway, I got better. dressed and I came out and, uh, they brought me to the set and there I met the same gentleman, Adam West, that I'd worked with, uh, when I was doing the dialogue for the Bruce and Dick mm -hmm. and he's dressed up in this big blue cape and cowl and all that stuff and and i'm saying what is going on you know what i mean yeah yeah and and, and nobody nobody and and the thing is is that and i did the lines and then now then i for the first time i heard the word batman i still didn't know what it was i had never heard of batman never heard of the comic book so anyway i got through the screen test and um uh, i went back home and for a period of six weeks, I didn't hear anything, mm -hmm. except I would get phone calls once or twice a week, either from, well, usually from the, from the studio, someone in the wardrobe department said, oh, I'm calling from 20th Century Fox wardrobe department. Can you tell me which shoe size you are? Or do you have a hat size? Well, I never wore a hat. But, you know, and, and all these questions. Yeah. And at the end of six weeks, I got a call from these agents they were so uninterested in me, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they said, we would like to have you come in and sign contracts. So I said, great, they're finally going to formally accept me as a, as a, as a, you know, um, an actor to, you know, for them to represent me. Mm -hmm. So I went in and when I sat down and they handed me a pen to sign the contracts, I looked down, I said, wait a minute, this isn't the name of your agency. They said, no, no, it's, it's, it's what it is, is, the um, studio contracts, you know? Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? What studio contract? You mean 20th Century Fox? And I said, what? They said, yeah, you knew you had the part, right? No, oh, I, I never know. heard I had it. And it turns out that the studio never told me I had the part, but thought my agents told me I had the part. My agents never told me I had the part, but thought the studio. So I had the part for six weeks while I'm rotting, waiting to see if I'm going to get it. 
and I and I'd already had it. I just didn't know about it. I'm the only one that didn't know. That's funny. That's funny. And so then the show goes on air, and I'm curious because it was your first acting job. Um, how you dealt with this immediate fame, this immediate status as an, as you know the popular icon? How, how did how did that feel? That had to be weird. Had to be odd. Well, it wasn't quite immediate. Let me explain to you. We shot for about three or four months. Okay, and I was on a cold sound stage, uh, you know, in, in a costume that I did about 30 seconds of, of a scene at a time. 30 seconds. That's not very much. Right. It's like I have, a, I have a, a, a one sentence. Batman has one sentence. And uh, you, you can't really understand what you're doing when you're doing it in those small pieces. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. You can't really understand it fully. So um, I... Uh, I didn't really appreciate what it was until I saw it when it aired. I started filming in September of 1965, and it aired January 12, 1966. Mm-hmm. So October, I said it was like three to four months that I was working, but I, you know, I, I just didn't see anything. And then on on the opening night on January 12, 1966, I was at home and uh, you know waiting, anxious to see how it came out, and. Uh, I was completely blown away. I mean, I had never heard the Batman theme music. I had never seen the pows and the zaps or the graphics or the colored or the, or the, the villain's hideout that, that the camera was turned on an angle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, and the, and the signs that said villain's hideout or whatever, you know? Yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I mean, I had never seen all of that. And, and so I was basically caught up like the rest of America was. And I thought, gee, this is a really good program. And it turned out that uh, on the opening night in North America, which you know includes Mexico and U.S. and Canada, 55% of all the televisions that were turned on on that night were watching Batman. That's and incredible. the other 45% of all the other stations were watching other programming. That's- so it was huge, giant. And, um, you know, that gives you an idea of what it was like. Yeah, and I think uh, you say it started airing in 66. That means this is the 50th anniversary this year of, uh, of, of Batman. So that, and it's incredible because right. it's endured. And I think sitting here, I, I want to get your opinion on it. Uh, maybe you haven't thought about this, but I think all of the not knowing that you had in the audition and, and, you know, leading up to it, I think that worked in your favor into getting the role because of the innocence of the boy wonder. What, what do you think? Exactly. No, you're a hundred percent correct. You're a hundred percent correct. I will tell you one thing. When I got the role, the executive producer called me in to say, and to, to talk to me. And he said, would you like to know why we selected you? And, and I said, sure. He said, yeah, we had 1100 young guys we interviewed. But out of the 1,100, we chose you for the following reason. He said, forgetting that this is a television show, forgetting that there was a comic book, if you can uh, imagine that there really was a Robin, mm-hmm. I mean, really, you know, and, and all of this, then in our opinion, you, Bert, personally, are what we envision Robin to be. You personally, wow. okay? So we don't want you to, quote, act. We want you to be yourself. And we only ask one other thing. We want you to be enthusiastic, which I'm – don't worry about me being enthusiastic. If anything, <laughs> yeah. that's down. So I said, okay, and that's what I did. And all the things that people love, you know, taking your fist and hitting it into your palm and all these things, none of that was directed. That was just me. Wow, it's incredible. So you know, and it and it really worked, and and I got along with Adam West so well. We were instantly friends. He has a marvelous, hilarious sense of humor. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know, it, and it's funny because even now, when we go out and make personal appearances, the two of us, even if we're just standing there, not saying a word, people see us and they immediately start laughing. You know, and it's, it's like, why are they laughing? You know, and it, but but we get along great, and the chemistry that we have had for fifty years is just amazing. 
Yeah, and he was he became. Uh, I've heard you describe him as your mentor. Um, what's the most important thing, uh, either about acting or about life, that Adam uh, Adam taught you uh, over the course of you knowing each other? That you really, in everything you do, you really have to analyze the situation. It's uh, it's kind of like what they say carpenters do: measure twice and cut once. Mm-hmm. Meaning, really really try to figure out what you need to do, try to make the very best choices and then execute your choice. Exactly. That's great. And you made a great choice recently. Uh, or I I don't know how, how many years you've been doing it. Um, but this, uh, this wonderful, wonderful, uh, it's from Cape Crusader to canine crusader with your, uh, with your dog rescue. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, about 22 years ago, my wife and I, rescued two great Danes. We were, we wanted to get a great Dane and we heard of two of them that needed to be rescued, meaning that they were in someone's home, but they couldn't hold on to them any longer. And they weren't yet in a shelter, uh, where they were, you know, would have been in immediate danger. So we rescued the two great Danes. Mm -hmm. We also heard of other great Danes that needed to be rescued, but they were again, also in people's homes, not in a shelter. You know, we're, they could be immediately, you know, put to sleep. Right. Well, we figured somebody else will rescue those. And later on, about a month or two later, we found out all the ones that we didn't take were put to death. Oh. And Great Danes are such gentle giants. I mean, that's really what they are. Yeah. And we were devastated. So I said to my wife, this is the first week of August of 1994. So, um, Within two more months, it'll be exactly 22 years. I said to her, I said, we can't let these dogs die. Let's just, I mean, we've got five acres. We have everything we need here. Let's just take some of these dogs. Let's just, you know, let's just feed them and care for them. And just for a couple of weeks, we'll find somebody else to take this over. You know what I mean? (laughs) Oh, I know. We figured in two weeks. Two weeks that somebody would take it over, and it's been 22 years. <laughs> oh, that's the. Uh, I think that's the pet owner's mistake in general. We'll just keep them till somebody yeah, else but, finds them. <laughs> exactly, but here's the thing: we started out with Great Danes, and a lot of people, you know, if I run into people across the country, they say, "Oh, you're the guy that re- re- uh, rescues Great Danes." Well, actually, we evolved rather dramatically, and we rescue 45 different breeds. The American Kennel Club, the AKC, acknowledges 164 breeds of dogs, and we rescue the top 45 breeds. Wow. So that's like one-third of the dogs' breeds that we rescue. And these are from tiny little two-pound Chinese crested that are one-third the size of a chihuahua all the way up to our giant English masses and Great Danes that are almost 300 pounds. So it's a huge range of dogs. Incredible. And, and the whole thing... Of, what we did is that, you know, to us, life is the most precious commodity in the world. Nothing more valuable than life. Mm-hmm. And these dogs are so innocent. They love you unconditionally, you know, whether you had the best day at work or the worst day at work. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Dogs love you unconditionally. So in, in having initially the giant breeds, which we are now the largest in the world with giant breeds, um, they have a traditionally short lifespan of seven to nine years, or in the case of Mastiffs, six to eight years. And when we would lose one of these dogs, we were devastated. So my wife and I decided that we were going to do whatever we could to help these dogs live longer, healthier, happier lives. What we created was a feeding and care program initially. And over a period of years, we got each of our dogs to live an average of about three years older. That's incredible. So the Great Danes that were only originally living seven to nine years were now living 10 to 12 years. But after we did that, you know, they're still only living 12 years. And uh, so we, uh, we said, there must be something more we can do. Let's see if we can make the finest dog food in the world for our dogs. Whatever the cost is, we're, we can afford it. Mm-hmm. So we set out to do that. And you have to understand, we never intended to sell our food. We're, we're so consumed with so many dogs in our house. And by the way, all of our dogs live inside our house. 
We don't have them outside in yards or cages or anything like that. They all live inside our house with us. Wonderful. You know, so it's a very communal atmosphere that is very nurturing, etc. Anyway, so we, uh, we, we, we created this food. And when we went into it, we had a very modest expectation, thinking, well, if we make the finest food for the best ingredients and the healthiest, and we do all of that, maybe we can pull out another year or two. Mm-hmm. What we didn't know was that there are many dog food manufacturers that know something the average person doesn't know, and what's that? which is the more fat content they put in dog food, the hungrier it makes dogs. Oh, wow. You know, there's a human example. If you remember about five years ago in Ohio, the man that went into a McDonald's every day for a month, he gained 55 pounds and almost died. He yeah. made a movie called Super Size Me. Yes. It's the same principle. And for me, it's a little upsetting, in fact, more, more than a little upsetting, to think that someone who makes dog food could actually put in extra fat into the food to give it to an unwitting animal to make that animal think they're always hungry so they'll eat more so that their 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 owner will have to go out and buy more dog food. It just doesn't hit me right at all. And, um, and but the, there's actually something and, and by the way, if you all you have to do is look in the back of any bag of dog food, there's a chart required by federal law called guaranteed analysis. The first item is protein, the second is crude fat. And you will see that the crude fat of almost all the dog foods in the U.S. is somewhere between 12 to 22 percent, unless it's a diet food that doesn't have all the nutrients that a growing dog needs. Mm. So we, uh, I, I even talked to my own medical doctor. I said, you know, what would happen if a human ate even 12 percent crude fat at every meal? And my own medical doctor said it would kill you. So you say to yourself, since a human is so much better designed than a dog, because look how long we're living, mm-hmm. why would anybody give a dog a food that has all that extra fat in it? You know, if that's not good, there's, there's toxins in fat. So anyway, long story short, we made a food that we didn't add any extra fat. I mean, there is fat in food, but why? while everybody else is 12 to 22%, we're 9%. Incredible. And the real killer... This is the one that we believe is the real killer of dogs that shortens their lives because dogs have this amazing ability to smell and they smell the high fat content in dog food. Manufacturers actually spray the food with lard to get them to eat it. They call it palatability by spraying the food with a fat, okay, with, with this you know heavy chicken fat or or uh, animal fat. I hate to interrupt you. It just sounds so disgusting. Like, even just listening to you, it just sounds it is. gross. It, well, think of it this way. Would, common sense tells you, would you take bacon grease and pour it down your garbage disposal? No. Of course not. So why would you give a dog a food that is coated with with, with grease? Almost every, every dog food I've ever felt, almost everyone, that, as I can recall, everyone had a slightly greasy feel to it because of that sprain. Well, guess what? Grease doesn't dissolve very easily. And, and you, what's happening is dog's intestines are becoming a garbage disposal for grease. Mm-hmm. And that is, is terrible. So what did we do? With General Giants, we didn't add any fat. Ours is 9%. And because ours is low fat and, and tastes good to dogs, we didn't have to spray our, the outside of our food with a bunch of junk. You know what I mean? Exactly. So dogs, dogs will eat our food, but our food is so dry in your fingers that you could make a powder of it. And how it works, this is what we believe, is that when it goes in the dog's intestines, this very dryness I'm describing to you actually absorbs the grease that has accumulated from eating other dog foods. It absorbs it. And when your dog goes to the bathroom, it takes it out of your dog's body. I have so many people that have written to us and say that in three to five weeks, they don't even recognize their dog. Their dog is healthier than it's ever been. Their dog is, uh, their coats are better. Their alertness is, you know, greatly improved. And they thank me. Um, Some of them, one man wrote and said, I have a 12 year old Rottweiler. He never plays. He just goes out during the day and lays in the shade. And he, and then he wrote back to me, says, I've been feeding your food for five weeks. 
and he's running around crazy, making me exercise. He says, thank you for giving me my puppy back again, uh, which was very touching. That must make you feel... So that's how our food works, and that's how we can have dogs living as long as 27 years. And, and that's why at our rescue, the last time I checked, we had 15... Excuse me, we had 24 dogs that were living 15 to 26 years. And and no one else that I know of... And, and by the way, these are primarily giant breed dogs. So every one of these dogs has already lived twice their normal lifespan. And one of our dogs, her name is Tara. She's a Russian wolfhound. She's mm-hmm. 25 and a half years old. And just recently we were on Inside Edition. They came out to our house. And they said they think she is currently the oldest living dog in the world. Wow. And they videotaped her. And they talked about how, you know, about our food and how, and our feeding and care program, how we combine the two to make the dogs live longer. And it's all worked out wonderfully. So what I basically want to do is I, I know how people love their dogs. As, as I understand it, there's like 88 million dogs in the U.S. in 67 million homes. Mm-hmm. And every, everybody that I know that has a dog loves their dog intentionally and, and very intently. And, and, you know, if, uh, if you ask somebody, how long would you like your dog to live? Everybody I've asked has, has always said the same thing, forever. Yeah, so exactly. So they can't live forever, but they can double their lifespan if they follow our feeding and care program and use our Gentle Giants dog food, which, depending where you live, if you lived in California, Florida, or Arizona, it's, all, it's in Walmart stores. If you lived in Southern California, we're in Stater Brothers Markets, Ralph's, Gelson's, and Walmart. But across the country in the other states, our dog food is available on Walmart.com and on Amazon.com, where they there's no shipping charge. They send it to your local Walmart or local, you know, to your home, and uh, you know you you have no shipping, so it's really a terrific deal. That's important. That's important. Now, I want to ask something. I don't know if you've ever done any research into this, but listening to you talk about the other stuff that the other dog foods have, how is that allowed? <laughs> like, why isn't your method of, of doing it, of, of feeding dogs, of creating this healthy dog food, sort of the norm? Why is, why is this, this disgusting, proven unhealthy method of, of feeding dogs allowed if it's well, 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 first of all, I don't, I, I don't know that anybody, anybody has ever spent 22 years living with more than 50 dogs in their house, <laughs> personally feeding them every single day. Right. Okay. So I, I don't, I don't place any blame on anybody about this. I simply think that just like with human technology, you know, I mean, look how there, you know, there isn't a cure yet for cancer, but they're working on it. I mean. I think the focus has been on human health, and it hasn't been as much on dog health. So I don't place any blame. There are regulations of minimum, of that you know what I mean, mm-hmm. that for the food. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and but the, the minimums are so minimum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could drive a semi through the the minimum. Yeah. Um, but but I, I don't fault anybody. But but at the same time. We have, are so focused on on life. We're not. My wife and I take no salary from our rescue. We take no salary from this dog food. We don't, we don't take any. And and other companies are in the business of making a profit, and they have people that run them, you know, in a proper business way. But it's it, it, it's a lot different when you are spending your life trying to help animals live longer as opposed to selling a product to make a profit. You know, in other words, our focus is totally longevity. We don't take, you know, any money and and we have no salary we take from this food. And so we don't have the same um, requirements for operating our business. We, We think of it as like, how do we help dogs live longer? What can we do? Are we doing everything we can do? And, and, you know, we've, we've really refined this so well that we consistently have dogs living two, two, twi- two times their normal lifespan. And the one that we have is, is lived uh, three times their normal lifespan. 
It's incredible. It's incredible. And people can, uh, I, I just want to ask this, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. People can adopt from your, from your rescue, correct? You, uh, well, what we do now is we are, we are, we are adopting only locally. Mm. And the, what happened was, you know, we were doing, I don't know, 20 adoptions a week, wow. some weeks. And then the economy went very bad. And uh, people, that, then we were adopting all across the country. Mm-hmm. But what happened was there were people that, well-meaning people that, that when they couldn't keep the dog because maybe they lost their job or lost some member of their family, they're supposed to return the dog to us because we need to protect the dog for life. That's our commitment when we take a dog. We, we, we'll, we'll, we'll tell whoever gave it up to us that we will commit to protect that dog for life. Mm-hmm. And as a result, and none of us take any salaries, so all of a sudden now you have people in Seattle, Washington calling us saying, I can't keep the dog. I don't have the money to return it to you. You can either come and get it or I'm going to take it to an animal shelter. Ugh. So by the time we get the dog and get, get the, and, and buy a $300 crate and get a $600 airline ticket and get it medically checked out and, all, and get the health certificates and the acclimation certificates, by the time you get all of that, you spend two or three thousand yeah. dollars, and this is having to come out of our pocket when we're we're not making anything from it. You you understand? Of course, and, of course. And uh, and plus, we we focus. We 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 will spend whatever it takes to save a dog's life. We've had dogs that have come here recently, about six months ago. Someone who had adopted from us four years ago. He adopted the dog. We told him to get insurance for the dog. He never got around to getting it. And all of a sudden, about six months ago, the dog is limping, takes it to a vet. The vet says, your dog has got cancer in the leg, and it's likely, you know, going to kill the dog. There's nothing you can do. Just put the dog down. Mm. Well, he called us, and we said, you know, because we have a requirement in our adoption agreement that we have the right to try to save every dog's life. Okay. Yes. And so we we said we want you to bring the dog to our vet. We'll pay for it, and he did. And we had also consulted with a top surgeon, and they said, well, you know, there's a slim chance this dog's going to make it. Well, we know if we didn't do anything, the 100 percent chance the dog wouldn't make it. Yeah. So we spent seventy five hundred dollars for a leg amputation, and now the dog is completely healed is amazing how he can run on all three legs. You know, he's missing the fourth leg, but he's gotten around that. And he, for, and it didn't metastasize, meaning the cancer didn't spread. We got it in time. Mm-hmm. And now he is happily living with this owner, which the owner should have paid for, but couldn't afford it. So we paid for it. That's an incredible and, um, and, yeah. And, and so uh, anyway, but the thing is in our heart of hearts, we know we did the right thing. Okay. You know, and uh, we'd do it again if we had to. So if that kind of, I mean, if you really love animals, then you really are committed to do the right thing by them. Absolutely. And that is an important message. Burt Ward, this was fantastic. You were a great guest. Thanks for talking about Batman and sharing uh, and sharing your mission with uh, Gentle Giants. This was incredible. And uh, I don't think I told you this yet, but it's going to air on 4th of July. And I can't think of a of a better episode uh, for the to celebrate uh, a true American holiday with. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And and the one thing I want everybody to know again, if you if it's not in your local Walmart, get in touch with Walmart.com or Amazon.com. They ship it to you for no shipping charge, and this way everybody can get our food as inexpensively as possible. Absolutely, we'll make sure of that. I'll link right through it in our in our episode description, and uh, everybody will be all set that listens to this. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Bert. I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Everybody, go ahead and check out Gentle Giants website in the link below. That's gentlegiantsrescue.com. Also, gentlegiantsdogfood.com. That's it for us today. Thank you again to our season sponsors, Axtel Expressions and the Tangent Bound Network. Stay tuned to talkfor2.com as well as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for more from the number one performing arts podcast. Reach out by emailing talkfor2cast at gmail.com and talk about us on social media using hashtag talkfor2.
Two. Signing off for Talk for Two, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding everyone out there to keep talking for two. Happy Fourth of July. You can hear more show business interviews with the stars at talkfor2.com, where you'll also find one of a kind products to improve your own show. That's talk, the number four, TWO.com.